This animation will walk you through the basics on how different classes of antibiotics work and some of the most common mechanisms of resistance that stop them from working. For antibiotics to inhibit or kill bacteria, they need to target one of the core structures or physiological functions that bacteria need to survive and replicate. These include structural integrity, DNA replication, and protein synthesis. The antibiotics that we most often use in veterinary practice can be arranged into four functional groups. They may act on the cell wall, damage DNA or inhibit its transcription, inhibit protein synthesis, or interrupt the folic acid pathway. We're going to go through these one by one, but let's start with the antibiotics that act on cell walls. Bacterial cells are hyperosmolar compared to host tissues, so without a secure cell wall, they quickly fill with fluid and rupture. Antibiotics that act on the cell wall target either the binding proteins within the peptidoglycan layer or the phospholipid membrane. Beta-lactams are some of the most commonly used antibiotics in both human and animal health. This group is made up of a number of different classes, including the penicillins and cephalosporins. They all have in common a beta-lactam ring, which binds to penicillin binding proteins within the peptidoglycan layer of the cell wall. This destabilizes the structural integrity of growing cells, causing bacterial death by lysis. Next, we're going to look at some examples of antibiotics that damage DNA or inhibit DNA transcription. Fluoroquinolones act on enzymes called type 2 topoisomerases, which are responsible for the effective supercoiling and replication of DNA. By impeding these enzymes, fluoroquinolones create structural damage to DNA, resulting in bacterial cell death. Fluoroquinolones are considered a last-line therapy for serious gram-negative infections and are classed as critically important to human health. Examples used in veterinary medicine include enrofloxacin and marbofloxacin, but in Australia, all agents in this class are banned for use in food-producing species. Rifamycins don't damage DNA directly, but inhibit bacteria from transcribing sections of DNA to messenger RNA, by disrupting the enzyme RNA polymerase. This essentially shuts down gene expression, so bacteria can't conduct their normal cellular functions. Rifampicin is an example from this class that is used in veterinary medicine in specific circumstances such as rotococcus infections in foals. Next, we've got the antibiotics that interrupt or inhibit protein synthesis, also known as translation, there are a number of different classes in this category, all of which act on bacterial ribosomes. Bacterial ribosomes have two functional subunits, the 30S subunit, where mRNA is decoded, and the 50S subunit, where amino acids are sequenced into chains to make proteins. Antibiotics that disrupt normal protein synthesis result either in direct cell death or non-viable replication depending on the specific agent, bacteria, and dose. The last group we're going to look at are the antibiotics that interrupt the folic acid pathway, the sulfonamides and potentiated sulfonamides. Most mammalian species get folic acid from their diet, but bacteria have to make their own. Sulfonamides act as a competitive antagonist to one of the key precursors in the folic acid pathway, Without folate, bacteria are not able to produce nucleotides, the building blocks of DNA. Omethoprim is used concurrently to enhance the activity of sulfonamides because it inhibits key enzymes in the folic acid pathway, creating a synergistic effect. Resistance occurs when bacteria that are usually susceptible to an antibiotic develop mechanisms to withstand their effects. Resistance can occur due to bacterial adaptations, the acquisition of genetic material, or alterations in gene expression. The three most common ways that bacteria achieve resistance are by inactivating the antibiotic, 
altering the target site and or limiting the concentration of antibiotic within the cell. Bacteria may utilize a combination of different mechanisms simultaneously, and there are multiple pathways and gene variants that encode for similar resistance traits. A common mechanism of resistance against beta-lactam antibiotics is the production of inactivating enzymes called beta-lactamases. Beta-lactamases change the structure of the beta-lactam ring so that beta-lactam antibiotics can no longer bind to their target site. These days, we can get around most beta-lactamase producers using beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations, like amoxicillin clavulinate. The inhibiting agents in these combinations, so that would be the clavulinate in this example, have really only one job, and that's to irreversibly bind to the beta-lactamase enzymes, allowing the amoxicillin to get on with the task at hand. Recently, bacterial infections due to extended spectrum beta-lactamases, or ESBLs, have emerged throughout the globe. As their name suggests, ESBLs are able to inactivate a larger variety of antibiotics, including third-generation cephalosporins, another class classified as critically important to human health. A number of ESBLs are also resistant to beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations like amoxicillin clavulinate. Methicillin was the first antibiotic developed to treat beta-lactamase producing staphylococcal infections. For a short time, it proved to be effective, but Staphylococcus species soon developed a new mechanism of resistance associated with the MEK-A gene. This gene and its variants alter the shape of penicillin binding proteins, the target sites for beta-lactam antibiotics. The altered target site makes the bacteria resistant to all beta-lactam antibiotics, including beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations. The final common mechanism of resistance we're going to consider is the ability of some bacteria to limit the concentration of the antibiotic within the cell. Bacteria can achieve this through alterations in membrane porins that make it harder for the antibiotic to get into the cell in the first place, or by actively removing intracellular antibiotics via efflux pumps. Some bacteria employ both mechanisms simultaneously. Efflux pumps enable bacteria to remove a number of toxic substances, including organic solvents and heavy metals, as well as antibiotics. They are particularly important in gram-negative bacteria like E. coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Studies in canine otitis externa caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa have shown that the use of efflux pump inhibiting agents, such as tris edta can increase bacterial susceptibility to aminoglycoside and fluoroquinolone antibiotics. Research into efflux pump inhibitors has not yet identified any safe and effective agents for systemic use, things that could be used to treat serious multidrug resistant gram-negative infections. Such infections remain one of the greatest challenges facing modern medicine. We hope that this animation has improved your knowledge of antibiotics and some of the common mechanisms of antibiotic resistance. For more resources, head back to the online learning module or visit our website, amrvetcollective.com.